know how to switch off all the happy faces from the side of the slides. Why? Anyway, if you if you look, if you uh, yeah, but what would we want to do then? We, then we oh, can okay, all right. Next slide you're, comment. You're, you're all um, you're all mature adults. So I'll let you decide how you'd like to view the uh, the audience and so on. Anyway, um, yes, hello everyone. My name's James Oglethorpe, and I'm a long-standing friend of Rod's. And um, now, Rod, also, if anything goes wrong with me talking, I uh, and I lose uh, broadcasting because of Optus. Uh, give me a ring on my mobile phone, would you? That that should be good. Um, now, the the title of this talk is the side slippers, and uh, it's actually um, talking about the World War One history of Number Three Squadron in the Royal Australian Air Force. And the reason that I'm involved with this topic is that I maintain the website as a volunteer for the Three Squadron Association. And uh, it leads to, uh, you know, half a dozen interesting themes, which uh, there's about 40 slides in the show that I'll proceed to take you through. But um, if you can see my cursor moving on the screen, this, this plane here is called an RE-8 uh, to two-seater so-called core reconnaissance aircraft. And, um, this is the aircraft that Three Squadron flew in action on the Western Front in 1917 and 1918 against the Germans. And uh, this particular painting uh, has got a couple of Germans uh, <laughs> trying, trying to get a bead and the, uh, the Three Squadron gunner trying to keep them away. And meanwhile, the German flak, which is black, bursts in the air, uh, has discovered them as well. And so uh, this is what I call a bad day at the office. Anyway, we'll move on to the, uh, uh, our website's called threesquadron.org.au. And um, the quick history is that Three Squadron was part of the Australian Flying Corps in 1916 up to 1919. And it's been a part of the Royal Australian Air Force from 1925 to the present day. Um, the association that I do the volunteer work for was founded in 1946. And uh, we've had our website up and running ever since 2001. But the website includes uh, stuff from our newsletters going all the way back to 1946. So we actually have the equivalent of about 4,000 A4 pages, lots and lots of stuff. And uh, we pull in at the moment about 6,000 unique visitors per month. So uh, that's actually somewhat bigger than our, uh, a lot bigger than our association membership. Uh, we've got about 400 members in our association. And um, our website's also been archived by the Australian War Museum so that um, <clears throat> the National Library Pandora system keeps archived copies of it. Uh, so if anything were to happen to us, the uh, National Record still has our website on it, which is very nice of them. Now, uh, so what I'm gonna do is try and tell the story of the squadron using um, some of the treasures, half a dozen treasures from the, uh, from the website. And uh, the first of these treasures is called the James Brake Photo Collection. Now, uh, this chap here with the broken aeroplane and over here is James Brake. Um, as far as we can find out, he was the first man to sign on to number three squadron when it formed in uh, Point Cook in Victoria in 1916. And uh, he became one of the flight commanders and um, uh, apparently wasn't a particularly good pilot, so he ended up being armaments officer for the squadron, but he finished World War I still with three squadron. And uh, uh, the photo here at the bottom right shows James Brake with a, an aircraft called a Deeper Dusen. It's a, it's a French, very early um, aircraft. Now, this was a dangerous aircraft, and they realised that even in uh, like 1914 when they bought it. And um, it only ever flew once or so, and it was mainly used for taxiing training. But even as a taxi trainer, they managed to stack it quite a few times. And uh, this shows the result of one of the accidents. But the reason I mention this is because this particular aircraft is now preserved in the Australian War Memorial as the oldest existing aircraft of the uh, Australian Air Force. It's the oldest one that we've managed to hang on to. And uh, you can see it. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's in the, um, the storage warehouse rather than being in the real display at the moment. But it's... Uh, it's been preserved for posterity. And uh, inside James Brake's photo album, there's just a wonderful collection of, um, of old photos. I've just picked up one or two that really show interesting things. Uh, this aircraft's called a Brist Bristol box kite. And um, the, the word box kite is a, um, 
a bit of a nod to Lawrence Hargrave, the Australian inventor, who invented the box kite, which is basically a braced wing system. And uh, the Bristol, Bristol box kite was a very early aircraft. Um, it was powered by a little rotary uh, engine, and the pilots set out completely in the open. There was no cabin of any description. But it was a relatively safe aircraft because it flew incredibly slowly. If there was enough wind, it would fly backwards. And uh, this photograph shows after a bit of a prang where the, uh, the, the port side wheel has, has been smashed off and they've propped the plane up on a, an old, uh, well, I suppose it was a brand new in those days, uh, car. And uh, he's towing the wheel and uh, the rest of the boys are just seeing it safely back to the hangar. And um, I, I think the, these aircraft were basically expected to crash and they, they had very good repair skills on the station at Point Cook. You can see the hangars over there. Um, where they could basically replace everything. So like the proverbial shovel, they'd, uh, they'd replaced every part of the plane by the time it was eventually uh, finished its service life. Um, this is another of Jim, Jim's pictures, uh, which shows a couple of the recruits um, having a nice snooze because they only had one or two training aircraft. And so there was quite a lot of snoozing going on in between flights. Um, the Australians... Uh, training organization was completely hamstrung by a lack of supply of aircraft. We only really had the aircraft that had been purchased before the war broke out and the British were extremely slow to provide anything else for the men to train on and so when they did leave Australia they, they were basically in a very untrained state and they needed to go through months of training in Britain when they got there. Um, when I was researching James Brake, I discovered in the National Library Trove's, Trove system that his brother had written a letter to him in 1916, and his brother was a gunner in the Australian artillery, so he was already in France on the front. And um, But he took a great interest in uh, the aeroplanes flying over the top, and he wrote his brother a, um, a very good letter describing all the air battles he'd seen. And um, uh, probably the main point is that the... He's talking about the fact that immediately a plane got into the air, everyone is shooting at it, and um, the shots are poured towards it, but in fact, it's extremely hard to hit a, a plane moving even at very slow speeds. Um, but anyway, uh, Gunner William Brake later became a mechanic in three squadron. His brother got him into the squadron and uh, that got him away from the front. Um, but uh, he, it's, uh, he was also an expert in artillery and took a great, um, technical interest in it, including writing um, in this same letter descriptions of the various German shells that were being shot at him. And so uh, everything I know about German shells has been learned from, the, from this letter in the newspaper. Um, two more photos from the album showing three squadron departing from Laverton Station. Now, if you know Melbourne, Laverton these days is completely changed from, uh, from this ancient picture. Uh, it's now a, a very a massive centre of urban development. Um, but the boys basically uh, marched over to the station. And then uh, here you've got the steam train that uh, took them to Port Melbourne. Uh, at that stage, they were called the second Australian flying squadron rather than the third. And uh, the humorous reason was that the bureaucrats had formed two new squadrons, one in the Middle East and one in Australia, and both of them ended up being called second squadron. So that wasn't sorted out for about three months until they met later in England. Um, and this is also a, uh, a picture of the boat that took them away from Port Melbourne, uh, the HMAT, which means uh, uh, Her Ma His Majesty's Australian Transport Ulysses. And um, very sadly, uh, around about 70 of the squadron didn't return back to Australia. You know, they have sitting in various graves in Europe and Brit Great Britain. Um, and so for many of these men, uh, this was actually their last touch of Australia. But anyway, the, uh, once they got to Britain, uh, they went into a quite um, uh, expanded training routine. And so our next treasure uh, is, is the South Carlton teapot. Uh, the squadron was based at a, at a little, um, uh, Royal Flying Corps Station in uh, Lincolnshire, just about four kilometres north of Lincoln uh, City, uh, called South Carlton. And uh, the boys were in hutted accommodation on a, on a very windy open airstrip. 
but the local population were extremely hospitable. And uh, the boys would often come and um, uh, have tea and, and other entertainments with the, uh, the local people. And this teapot was presented by Three Squadron to this couple called Mr. and Mrs. Richards, who uh, uh, were obviously very well appreciated by the boys. And it's inscribed from the 69th Squadron AFC. Now, it was the same squadron, the same one that I'm calling number three, but um, they changed names yet again. Uh, the British decided that they were the 69th Squadron, and it took some months for the Australians to uh, basically change the number back to third again. Um, this teapot is owned by a doctor in Poland, who is the grandson of this couple, Mr. and Mrs. Richards. And um, so I had a very interesting communication with him to find out all about it. And we, we gradually worked out uh, the story of, uh, you know, how it came to, uh, to be uh, a relationship between the, the family and the, uh, the boys in the squad room. Um, this is a, a photograph in South Carlton of, of an Avro 504, which is a training aircraft and the sort of huts they were living in. I've used this photograph because it shows both in the one photo, very efficient, I thought. Um, although this is actually a few months after Three Squadron had left, but there were lots of instances where they crashed these training planes. Um, the South Carlton airstrip is up on a plateau uh, and the village is down in the valley and the uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the couple who were hosting the, uh, the squadron boys lived in a house called the Pheasantry because he was a gamekeeper. And... Um, you can see, though, that the size of an aerodrome in those days is only 700 metres. So this aerodrome only um, operated during World War I. It simply wasn't big enough to be extended into a, a normal Royal Air Force station later. And today it's just reverted to farmland, except there are a few slabs of concrete here and there that uh, still reveal the location of the airstrip. And um, Mrs Richard's uh, grandson, uh, also had quite a bit of correspondence that the boys had sent her, uh, postcards and so on. And uh, one of the notable ones is this postcard of Sergeant Thomas Kay. Uh, this photograph was, was taken before uh, the war and back in Australia. Um, and he was notable, though, because after the war finished, um, he actually flew in the Great Air Race from London to Australia with a pilot uh, called Captain Matthews. And... Um, Matthews and Kay had an incredibly adventurous um, uh, time in this race, uh, flying a plane called the Sopwith Wallaby. Um, they had more than a month of delays because they got bogged in snow. The, the race started at a very um, uh, bitter time of the winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, they were bogged. They were arrested as spies, I think in Bulgaria. They managed to escape from custody and get their plane going and fly away. And uh, so after many more adventures and uh, near crashes and other problems, they eventually crashed in Bali in a way that the aircraft basically couldn't be uh, resuscitated after that. And that was the end of their race. So by this stage, uh, the, uh, the Smith brothers had won, uh, the, um, won the race and won a £10,000 prize uh, for flying from the Australian government, a rare example of the Australian government being very generous. And uh, but Matthews and Kay, uh, anyway, uh, yet another example of uh, the sort of thing that, that happened when the war was over and the boys uh, wanted to try and use their flying skills. Uh, we did have some other three squadron people in the same air race. And uh, sadly, one of them uh, died five minutes after taking off. They were um, in an aircraft which was very heavily loaded and it simply stalled climbing out. And that was the end of that. Um, also, Three Squadron's movement from South Carlton into France to the battlefield. Um, the, when they left uh, South Carlton, they did leave behind several graves, which are uh, the Australian graves you can see with Australian flags here. And uh, one notable one is Air Mechanic Hansel. Uh, he was actually the first of the squadron's personnel to die. And um, he just died of illness. He suffered meningitis. He was sent up to Edinburgh for a training course. And um, very sadly arrived back from his training course in the, the cold winter month of February. Uh, the next day fell ill, the next day was dead. And they had um, very little means of treating meningitis in those days. And uh, 
when I looked him up, uh, the, the victories in Sydney uh, were quite amazing. He, um, he was a very, uh, very, very skilled young professional engineer. And he'd actually signed up at the age of 18, but he already was practicing at that stage as an engineer. And he'd actually put his age up in his application by a couple of years in order to, uh, to make it sound more like his, his CV matched his age. Um, and in addition to that, he was a very um, accomplished uh, athlete, a, a sprinter, uh, one and 200 meter sprint races. And he was one of the best in New South Wales. And in all probability, if the Olympics had been held in 1916 in Berlin, as they were supposed to be, um, George may well have gone to the Olympics. But uh, anyway, the World War I intervened and the Olympics didn't happen. Um, and as the squadron moved down to the Channel Coast to cross across to France, they had another crash, uh, which very sadly led to two casualties. The, uh, and these boys basically are buried um, in, in a huge uh, cemetery in the south of London. But uh, they crashed at the very famous uh, airstrip of Biggin Hill in Kent, which became very famous in World War II. And uh, anyway, once the, uh, the squad had arrived at this place called Lim, uh, it's spelt L-Y-M-P-N-E, but it's pronounced Lim with a silent P-N-E. Uh, and uh, when they got to Lim, uh, it was discovered that the flying corps weren't ready for them in France. And so they hung around for three weeks. Um, and they also, in the meantime, replaced all the engine bearers in their planes, which is probably a good idea as well. But where they went to uh, was the northern part of the Western Front, which was the part that was uh, garrisoned by the British forces. And uh, they started off in the Arras sector, uh, but they were really just backing up an existing squadron there. Um, but then they went into the Ypres salient. They uh, were based at a station called Balliol, and uh, they were only a few flying miles from uh, all of the front line around Ypres. And uh, they did, the, the role of three squadron was in these RE-8 aeroplanes. Uh, they were involved in air combat, but uh, they, they often had uh, dicing with uh, enemy fighters. And in fact, the Albatross fighter that's preserved in, in uh, Canberra in the War Memorial was shot down by three squadron and landed behind the Australian lines. Uh, but their main roles were doing artillery spotting uh, photography and tactical bombing and what those things mean is artillery spotting is that uh, the RE-8 aircraft goes up in the air and then they're using a very simple radio setup um, just basically a one-way Morse code setup uh, sending but no receiving um, to send out uh, coded messages saying how accurate the artillery is and the planes were able to uh, guide artillery to land right on key German assets such as uh, uh, German artillery batteries and also if they saw something like a counter-attack forming up uh, they could uh, do what was called a zone call which would uh, bring artillery down on a certain map reference and um, so these little two-seat aircraft which were not the glamorous fighter aircraft were actually doing uh, a lot more of the the really um, huge impacts on the German army. Uh, that uh, a man with a radio set up in an RE-8 could, uh, you know, literally wipe out thousands of the enemy uh, if he happened to see them forming up for an attack. Uh, with the photography that they did, that was another element of the, the trench warfare, that the, uh, uh, if you don't have good maps, you can't do anything anything related to artillery or trench warfare. You can't uh, create plans of where people attack and so on. And so the planes went up, uh, aerial photography developed very quickly, and the planes went up basically taking a um, series of photographs, which the Germans were very keen to stop them from doing. And um, the photographs were then uh, printed and made into maps. And then the maps were used again from the air to guide the artillery onto targets that had been picked out in the aerial photographs. And uh, they also did tactical bombing with their planes. They could carry a few small bombs underneath. Um, 
And they often carried bombs uh, when they were doing all sorts of other jobs, such as photography, and they just merrily dropped the bombs on the Germans as they came back home. Uh, so this base was their base for four months and until the huge German spring offensive broke out in 1918, uh, when they were basically rudely evicted from the uh, from the airstrip and they uh, the squadron lost a few personnel killed by German shell fire, actually. And um, here today in Balliol, you can see the uh, Australian graves are uh, ranged around this area. And in the background, you can see mass burials of uh, many unnamed graves uh, from all the fighting that rolled backwards and forwards over the town. Now, my number three treasure uh, is actually located down in Museum Victoria. Uh, this is the first Australian designed and flown aircraft. And uh, it was built by a guy called Jack Dugan. And uh, he flew it in July 1910. And uh, that was actually only um, a few months after Harry Houdini made the first successful flight in Australia using a French aircraft. And um, Jack Dugan joined uh, three squadron in Point Cook when it was first formed and he served with the squadron all the way through the war and he ended up um, being a very highly distinguished pilot. Uh, I, I pointed out here as well that uh, he actually taught himself to fly in this plane. There was, there was no flying school of any description in Australia. He had built the plane based on diagrams and uh, instructions in various uh, aviation magazines and textbooks and he had taught himself to fly it. So that's amazing. And he had numerous crashes, but the plane was just made of bamboo, so it was easy to repair. Uh, and he actually met his wife after one serious crash, and she was the nurse who nursed him back to health. And um, he eventually became a flight commander in Three Squadron. Um, here are a couple of pictures of uh, Mia Mia in Victoria. Uh, this is Jack flying his home-built aircraft in 1910. And... Um, here we are 50 years later in 1960, um, they unveiled this memorial, which is still there in Mia Mia, uh, which was the, the golden jubilee of, uh, of the first flight. And the man here unveiling it is actually Sir Richard Williams, who was the um, uh, so-called father of the Royal Australian Air Force. And uh, he was uh, commanding uh, number one squadron in the Middle East in World War I. Um, the sort of things that uh, Jack Dugan was involved in, uh, some of you have been to the War Memorial in Canberra might have seen this enormous gun called the Amien gun. Um, well, this was discovered actually by Dugan and his observer, Patterson. Uh, they, they saw it firing and they were able to note the location of it. And later when the huge Allied offensive uh, rolled over that area, it was a key target for the Australian troops to capture. And so it was captured on the 8th of August, which has been called the Black Day of the German Army. And um, they captured the whole train and the whole thing was brought back to Australia and was put on display uh, with the War Memorial, or actually in Canberra Railway Station. But then during World War II, it was um, used for uh, testing artillery, I think, in South Australia. And very sadly, most of the carriage was destroyed after World War II. But the barrel has been saved and... Um, and now is one of the War Memorial's uh, prized possessions. But that was uh, basically one of the things that Jack found. And on the same day that he found this gun, um, he turned up to be a pallbearer at the Red Baron's funeral. And uh, this is actually Jack at the foot of the coffin there. Uh, I've always said that the, these people are Air Force pilots. They're not professional undertakers, obviously. Uh, they, they literally dropped the Red Baron. Uh, now, the, the Red Baron was shot down um, over the top of the Australian front lines in uh, the Western Front, and Three Squadron was the responsible um, entity for picking up crashed aircraft on the front. And uh, as a result, they salvaged the Red Baron's aircraft, and they also recovered his body. Uh, one of the Three Squadron men was awarded with a military medal uh, for crawling out under shell fire to bring the body back into cover, because uh, the Germans were uh, shelling the site where the the Red Baron's plane came down um, because there was a crowd of souvenir hunters gathering around it. Anyway, the Bar Baron was buried the next day, um, uh, only a few kilometres from the Three Squadron airfield. And we know from their records that the coffin was painted in the standard PC-10 aircraft, green aircraft colour, uh, which was used for the RE-8 aircraft. 
and they made a large plate on the coffin in both English and German describing the, uh, the Baron. Um, uh, sadly, as far as we know, the, the, the grave, uh, you can see actually floral tributes and things were, were provided by the Royal Air Force and the uh, uh, Australian Flying Corps. But uh, the, the French population didn't like Germans and uh, we understand that the grave was vandalised almost immediately uh, that the ceremony was over. Um, but anyway, the, the Baron's body was later taken back to Germany and uh, uh, today he's, his grave is in uh, Wiesbaden in the Rhineland. But uh, he was moved several times. Uh, this was uh, the first of his five funerals. Uh, he was moved back to his family estate in Prussia. Then the Nazis moved him into the centre of Berlin, uh, which turned out when the Russians occupied the city to be right on the edge of the Berlin Wall. And um, the Richthofen family successfully uh, applied to the East German government to move his body to Wiesbaden, where it still is today. And uh, talking a little bit about uh, Three Squadron meeting the Red Baron Circus. Uh, they, they called it the circus because of the bright colours on the German aircraft compared to the dull greens on the, uh, on the Allied aircraft. Um, so two of uh, Three Squadron's RE-8 aircraft went off on a photo reconnaissance um, sortie and they were attacked by floor, four of the, uh, the Red Baron's uh, circus and they actually shot one down. They claimed a red-nosed triplane. Uh, and when they landed, they were told that the Red Baron had come down and uh, Three Squadron actually submitted a claim for shooting him down, but we realised that it wasn't uh, the Baron. But uh, later historians have matched up that there was a German ace called Hans Wies and uh, he got a severed rudder cable that went down out of control but managed to get back to base. But that was the victory that Three Squadron claimed. Uh, there was no loss for the RE-8s. They, they successfully got away from these German aces. And uh, this photograph over here is actually a photograph of the trench lines around Hamel, uh, which was part of the, uh, the job that those photographic planes were doing on the day. And uh, you can see how um, vital the uh, information is from these photographs. It can show you if you wish to attack this, which we eventually did on the 4th of July, uh, this shows you every detail about how to, um, to break into this, uh, this trench system. And um, uh, also they took up some of the Australian commanding officers as well to, to show them, to familiarize them with the territory they were going to uh, attack over. Uh, the other point I have down here is that uh, just across the road from Three Squadron, where RAF number 209 Squadron was stopped with camels. And they actually painted the noses of their camels red. They call themselves the, the Baron Hunters. And, uh, and they were the ones who the RAF awarded the, uh, the victory to for shooting down the Red Baron. Uh, the story went like this, that there was a, one of the camel pilots from 209 called Watt May, who was a Canadian, uh, he basically broke away from the fight and Manfred dived after him. They went on a very low level chase. And this picture here is actually the side of a building in uh, Captain Roy Brown's hometown in Canada. And uh, they've painted the landscape quite well. This is the, the Somme River is down in the valley below us here. And they're showing Captain Roy Brown's camel and uh, the Red Baron's triplane. And up there is Wap May, the other Canadian pilot. Um, so Roy Brown uh, swooped down on top of these two planes at low level, made a firing pass and then zoomed away. Uh, but he didn't hit the Red Baron. Uh, Manfred continued to fire, fire at WAP all the way up the hill here and over the top uh, up to there. Uh, at this point, they were actually well behind the front line. And this area around here was occupied by Australian artillery units. And they included uh, several trained anti-aircraft machine gunners. And um, the machine gunners basically... Uh, started taking pieces off the Baron's triplane and he knew he was in trouble and he then turned around the ridge here over the top of the forest uh, but then he was fatally hit with a single bullet and he landed down glided down and landed uh, just outside one of the Australian artillery units and uh, so anyway the Australians always uh, quite clear that it was Australian machine gunners that shot him down uh, but the Royal Air Force, who'd only been formed on the 1st of April 1918, um, we were less than two weeks later, oh, sorry, we were three weeks later. So um, the, the Royal Air Force claimed the kill. Uh, they, they needed the publicity and they needed the uh, morale boost. 
Um, but it's a good way to start an argument between Australians and Canadians is the, uh, to look at the, uh, or to argue about who shot down the Red Barons, even today. Um, this is a little clipping from the Three Squadron War Diary. And very interestingly, at the time, he was actually called the Red Falcon, not the Red Baron. Um, the the Parliament's Red Baron only came up in the 1930s. And uh, he was called the Red Falcon because he used to dive from, from high to great speed and onto his victim. Um, and uh, another interesting fact is that these days there's a, there's a historical marker where the crash was claimed to have occurred. But in fact, the crash occurred about 200 metres away. And um, we know this from the Three Squadron War Diary because the Three Squadron recovered the, the wreck. Um, when his body was brought back to the squadron, uh, because the squadron was full of professional photographers, they actually attached him to a sheet of uh, corrugated iron and um, made the photograph uh, with quite strong lighting. They actually applied uh, baking soda as, uh, as makeup to the Baron's face. His face was damaged in the crash, but he hadn't been shot anywhere except through the chest. And the angle of the bullet proved that it was coming up from the ground. And um, uh, these days, a, an Australian machine gunner called Cedric Popkin is given the credit for shooting him down, at least in Australia, if not in Canada. Uh, very interestingly, the, uh, as you can see, the War Memorial's copy of this photograph is a very poor one. But I have been contacted by the chap in Britain who knows where the glass plates are, uh, because the photographer who took the, the pictures was a British um, RAF person. Uh, very unfortunately, I've ne not heard again from this uh, uh, photographic uh, plate owner. I think there was a very nasty divorce in the family. So I'm hoping that uh, one day um, the, the husband and wife can uh, settle their differences and the glass plates can make their way onto the historical record. But that also be worth quite a lot of money these days. Um, also, if you, if you look in the War Memorial, they have quite a few Red Baron relics and almost all of them have den been donated by three squadron people. Uh, because they had access to the wreck. Uh, this shows the control column of the Fokker triplane and the left and right machine gun buttons. Um, this plane, though, uh, although everyone thinks of him as flying an all-red plane, he only flew this for the last few weeks of his flying career. That um, Prior to that, he was flying a green Fokker triplane, uh, prior to that, flying a red albatross, and prior to that, uh, flying plywood-coloured uh, light brown albatrosses. So, but the, he, he became called the, uh, the Red Knight of Germany um, in, a, in a book, an autobiography, which was actually ghost written for him. And, uh, and that's where the red came from. And so he, he used red from thereafter to, uh, to stand out in the sky as the leader of his circus. Uh, and the last slide on the topic of the Red Baron is why does people know who the Red Baron is? That, and, and strangely enough, um, he wasn't a well-known person that, um, he, although he was the top scoring ace in World War I, that's a fairly arcane topic. But in the 1950s and 60s, um, the Peanuts cartoon uh, started using uh, Snoopy the dog in battles with the Red Baron. And um, it, it had enormous circulation, around 200 million readers around the world in the 1960s. And in 1966, there was actually a chart-topping uh, single called Snoopy and the Red Baron, uh, which I can recall the uh, girls at my primary school go-go dancing to, um, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 or more. Uh, and uh, anyway, the, the Red Baron, because he became famous in the Peanuts cartoons, became, has been famous ever since. And so if you want to sell a World War I aviation book, if you can get the Red Baron on the cover, that's a good way to sell the book. Uh, but very interestingly, there's actually historic film showing Manfred, his dog was called Moritz, and here's a picture of Moritz wearing a flying helmet and goggles, and um, Manfred also had a lucky charm, which was a blue glass dog. Now, this is held in Britain at the moment, and the story is that he didn't take it with him on his last flight, so uh, may maybe he should have. But anyway, the fact that there were these dog associations with the Red Baron, I think it's very unlikely that Charles Schultz knew anything about it, but it's amazing how history goes in circles like this if you do enough research. 
Anyway, everyone knows who the Red Baron is and no one knows who Jack Dugan is, but here's the story of Jack's military cross. It's quite a, a boy's own adventure. So uh, Jack and Alec Patterson uh, flew a photography sortie out past Villers Britain, where the uh, Australian National War Memorial is today. And they were attacked by four Fokker triplanes of Jasta 6. Now, down here, we've got a picture of uh, the painting, actually, of Jasta 6 triplanes. And this painting has really captured, actually, the sort of menace of these aircraft. They were highly manoeuvrable. They were tiny, very powerful, and um, uh, really fantastic dogfighting aircraft. Um, now, the single RE-8 was under great disadvantage being attacked by four triplanes, but uh, the three squadron boys weren't uh, very worried about uh, you know, dicing it with these German aces. And uh, they actually were able to shoot down one triplane. So one of them was shot down out of control. And the other three, though, uh, basically kept attacking the RE-8. And the fight continued back from the German side of the lines, uh, back over Allied lines. And by this stage, uh, Jack had been hit by two German bullets. And Alec had been hit by five, but they were still basically keeping up a, uh, a defence of, of, uh, against the triplanes. And the REH petrol tank, which was situated over the top of the lap of the pilot, had holes in it. So there was, uh, Jack had a lap full of petrol. The tailplane of, of the RE8 was on fire <laughs> and the boys had no parachutes. That was uh, RAF policy because the, uh, they were worried that if they gave the men parachutes that they'd waste their valuable aircraft. So they got no parachutes. So they had to get down and they landed back over the Allied lines, actually on the French. Uh, the French had control of the front just south of Villers Britain. There. And um, anyway, the, uh, they were claimed by a, a German ace called Franz Hemmer. And the picture here has Hemmer's plane uh, featured. He had a wavy line on the side because he apparently had very nice wavy blonde hair. And um, Jack received a military cross for saving Alec's life because Alec was very seriously wounded. So Jack got medical treatment for Alec and um, presumably this was all being done in French because it landed in the French area. And also Jack, before he allowed the ambulance to take him away, um, Jack recovered the photographic plates off from the RE8. And so the valuable photographs that they'd taken over the front were saved as well. And today the War Memorial actually has um, Alec's um, service dress tunic as one of their uh, items in their collection. And this includes a military medal, which Alec won as an artilleryman in Pozieres. And uh, if you know about World War I, that's, that was a horrific battle in the Somme in 1916. And uh, so winning a military medal in those circumstances, Alec's, Alec must have uh, you know, been a magnificently brave person. Now, my fourth item uh, of treasures is actually two items, um, a German aircraft called a Halberstadt and an RE-8, which is today popularly known as Sylvia, although the historical evidence doesn't really say that it ever was called Sylvia, but that's what we'll call it at the moment. The, uh, the Halberstadt was actually captured in mid-air by Three Squadron on the 9th of June in 1918. And, uh, the RE-8, uh, Sylvia, was actually the longest serving plane on the Western Front as far as all the British forces were concerned. And it had 440 combat hours over the front in 147 sorties. And so it was a real survivor, this plane. Um, almost every mission, they'd come back with bullet holes in the canvas. And, uh, but almost everything could be easily fixed and the planes usually flew the next day. And the men were nonchalant. They would often uh, just compare how many bullet holes when they were having dinner in the evening, how many bullet holes they had that day and see who did best. And the thing that joins these two aircraft together is that both of them were preserved for the Australian War Museum. So they were both brought back to Australia. But in 1925, there was a fire in the museum collection. Uh, very sad story. They were intending to move the... Um, collection from Melbourne to Sydney. It was in the exhibition building in, in Melbourne. They crated up the aircraft and the crates were stacked outside and it was very hot weather in February. And there was a cycling race nearby in the, uh, the nearby uh, sports oval near the exhibition building. And thousands of people had attended and uh, the 
cleaners at the end of the day swept up thousands of thrown away pamphlets and other bits of uh, paper from the crowd and piled them up into a pile and set fire to them. And unfortunately, the wind blew up and the valuable aircraft went in highly flammable uh, wood and dope and uh, uh, oil and all sorts of flammable things inside the crates, they all went up. And uh, there were six German aeroplanes destroyed, but also Sylvia was destroyed as well. And for that reason, the uh, uh, the German aircraft that survived today in Canberra are the uh, lucky survivors of, uh, of this fire. Um, here's an illustration from the top of a model kit, uh, which shows how uh, the Halberstadt was captured that uh, one of the three squadron aircraft was coming home from a, a mission over the German lines and they spotted this German coming back over the British lines and they managed to sneak up underneath it and then get the drop on it with their machine gun so that the Germans realised that they were covered and uh, they were only herded back to the airstrip where three squadron uh, claimed them as a prize and uh, this is the war prize sitting on the airstrip surrounded by the squadron personnel. You can see the uh, uh, the mechanics are all wearing their overalls over here and the officers uh, gathered around as well, uh, much, much better turned out between the two sides of the squadron. Um, and the, the two uh, men who were manning the plane that captured the German, uh, they were called Armstrong and Mart, and this is them here. The, this is the official picture that was taken of them looking all very, uh, gung-ho wearing their flying helmets and uh, gauntlets and then uh, Armstrong's family has a photo album which shows the boys taking off this gear uh, after the official photograph was taken and this, this shows the real joy they had from their uh, their accomplishment. Um, also I, I couldn't resist this is another picture from a, a collection in the National Library showing three squadron uh, mechanics turning up for lunch and uh, it's just delightful. It, it brings all of these uh, faces back to life after a hundred years. Now, Sylvia uh, is what they call the reproduction aircraft in Point Cook today, which is one of the uh, the real treasures of the uh, RAF Museum in Point Cook. And uh, uh, funny enough, though, that all the research we can do at the moment says that the name Sylvia was on a different aircraft, and um, the marking they have of a doll inside the D was probably also on a different aircraft. Uh, so in a way, at the moment, the RAF Museum's aircraft is a tribute to three different aircraft, not just one. Uh, my fifth uh, treasure uh, is in the War Memorial in Canberra in the 1918 gallery. Uh, this is an original a parachute manufactured by three squadron. Uh, it's called a Hamel parachute. And um, Three Squadron had a flight commander named Lawrence Wackett. Um, he became a real pioneer of the Australian aviation industry. And um, he went on to a, a, a stunning career as an industrialist and was eventually knighted for his work in manufacturing aircraft through World War II. Um, but anyway, Wackett was uh, very interested in mechanical solutions to problems. And what they had to do was uh, they came up with the plan to drop ammunition to the infantry from the aeroplanes using these parachutes. And Wackett came up with a way of fitting the boxes, the boxes of ammunition, onto the standard bomb rack of, of the RE8. So they could carry two boxes. And uh, this was a, an enormously successful technique. It allowed them to take the Vickers guns, the infantry Vickers guns, forward with the main attack and uh, give much more firepower to the advancing troops. And uh, this technique was then spread throughout the, uh, the British forces uh, for the rest of World War I and was one of the instrumental things in breaking through the German defence lines again and again. And so uh, we, were, we were basically, you can see that the boys are quite proud of their, their invention there. And uh, I've got a slide here about Lawrence Wackett's career. Um, this is him in World War I. He, he started off with one squadron in the Middle East. Uh, in all likelihood, he fought the first ever air-to-air air -air combat uh, of the Australians versus the Germans. Uh, this is in the Middle East. He actually set up a machine gun on the top of a wing of one of the planes they had uh, in Egypt there. And uh, so they were able to surprise the Germans by, uh, by firing at them 
uh, when the Germans were, were firing in their direction. So that's the first that we know of uh, an air-to-air -air exchange of fire uh, by the Australian Flying Corps. And um, in this picture here, Billy Hughes visited the front in 1918. And uh, here he, the, he was the Prime Minister of Australia. And here he is sitting in the, uh, the cockpit of the RE-8. Uh, Wackett's actually showing him the, uh, the office there. Um, and also here is uh, another uh, three squadron flight commander who was Reg Francis, uh, who was the pilot most of the time of Sylvia, the long serving aircraft. And uh, this portrait here shows Sir Lawrence Wackett with uh, Sabre jet aircraft in the background. And it's amazing to him uh, to think of him going from the dawn of aviation all the way through to manufacturing double supersonic jets because uh, three squadron operated several of his products. This is an Australian built CAC Mustang, Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation uh, in three squadron service. Uh, this is a CAC Sabre, uh, which three squadron operated for the years from uh, 1956 through to about 1967. And the, the Mirage aircraft was mainly built by the government aircraft factory, but Wackett made the engine and he also made the tail assembly. And so, uh, uh, quite an amazing connection from the very early days of bashing iron down in the uh, the bomber acts of the RE-8 uh, through to producing a double supersonic fighter. Um, another uh, wonderful photograph I've got here is, uh, this is a different aircraft called a Bristol Fighter, a um, somewhat more powerful and fast aircraft than the RE-8. And this is actually Lawrence Wackett in the cockpit here. Uh, he did a quite a famous mission where he, he did uh, strategic reconnaissance uh, using the Bristol fighter that is going across the German lines and into the back zone. Um, his report was that he was under almost continuous machine gun fire from down below. He was flying at low level, but he was able to take oblique uh, photographs, which means sideways facing photographs. And uh, these were extremely valuable in the Australian attack around about the 25th of September in 1918. And uh, the Bristol fighters actually, uh, three squadron transferred all of their activities onto Bristol fighters, but only after the war was over. But they stayed in um, France and then Belgium uh, for six months. Uh, well, when I say stay, most of the personnel were on leave or sent off on training. But uh, the Australian Flying Corps didn't return back to Australia till the middle of 1919. Um, now, the Battle of Hamel in 1918 was held on the, first of, of the 4th of July, 1918, American Independence Day. And there were quite a substantial number of American troops included in order to give them a baptism of fire. And, um, but the Battle of Hamel was actually a, a, a dress rehearsal for all of the successful battles that followed in the last 100 days of World War I, that um, the Australian General Monash combined tanks, aircraft, you can see a parachute with ammunition here, and uh, precise artillery plans and all sorts of subterfuge, um, very detailed planning in order to uh, break through the German lines and capture Hamel. And um, this battle, the, the troops thought so highly of it, uh, that they, this was produced as a Christmas card to be sent home uh, to the folks at home. And uh, you can see that there's quite frank treatment of casualties and people being killed, people being wounded. But uh, this is what the men wanted to show, that they, they developed a way of breaking through the, uh, the German lines and uh, that they were there at the time. Uh, Monash himself uh, was back at his headquarters when the battle was going on. Uh, and we've got a a souvenir from Monash's own files here. Uh, this is a map that was marked up by three squadron in flight uh, during what was called a contact patrol. So it's a low level flight. Uh, now this is a map, the blue line is the British start line. All the red lines are German trenches. So they've all been copied down from the aerial photographs. They didn't show the British trenches because they didn't want these maps to give away information to the enemy. But the idea was that the RE-8 flew over the top of the Australian forces, sounding a, a klaxon, a horn. And each of these penciled crosses shows where flares were sent up by the Australian troops. So you can see they've advanced 
a couple of kilometres in from the uh, from the start line. And as the plane flew along, they noted where the front line was at that stage. And there are notes on there saying that some of the tanks are at their objectives and also they could see our troops digging in. Uh, and this is signed by an Australian uh, named Oster, Oscar Whitcomb. And uh, he was flown by a pilot named Lee Smith. Uh, and we know this paper would have been dropped down to Monash in a, um, a little message carrier. It was basically a canvas pouch with a coloured streamer attached. And this was the way that Monash found out how his battle was going, because uh, you being radio guys, you'd know that there was no radio communication with the front troops in those days. They had to use telephones. The telephones weren't run out during an attack. And so the real way that the general found out how his attack went is to get reports back from the Flying Corps uh, showing where the troops had got to. In this case, it showed that Hamel was an enormous success. And down here, there's a it's timed by the Australians at 5 a.m. That's when they dropped the message. And at 5.12, the message has been received in Monash's headquarters. And he's kept this as his souvenir of the, the moment that he knew that his battle had succeeded. And uh, this was quite a big moment for Monash. Uh, he was knighted later, but uh, he was under a cloud because of his Jewish heritage and uh, also the fact that he was a sort of self-made engineer. Um, Billy Hughes and various other powerful figures in the Australian administration took a dislike to him. And uh, uh, Billy Hughes went to see Monash a few days before the Battle of Hamel, which is the time when Mon Hughes was photographed in the uh, Three Squadron RE8. And uh, Hughes, it said, had the intention of sacking Monash at that time. So uh, very luckily for Australia and for the British side, uh, Monash kept his job and went on to enormous success and his system of winning this battle uh, was basically photocopied up and down the British front. Uh, and this actually shows the breakthrough battle called the Battle of Amiens on the 8th of August, uh, 1918. And the, uh, you can see that, again, it shows casualties being treated, but tanks, these are three squadron aircraft and uh, the Australian troops going forward uh, over the top of the German lines. And uh, again, this is a strange way to say Happy Christmas to your family, but uh, this is what the boys were really proud of. The last of our treasures is uh, actually comes from the collection of Mr. Rod Miller. Um, and Rod, I'll, I might let you tell the story later about how you, you came to get hold of it. But um, this is a trench magazine. That is, it's something which Three Squadron printed uh, at the front line in their, in their front line uh, aerodrome and it was actually um, they printed this in August 1918 it's actually a frantic time there was, there was a huge amount of action going on uh, but they were obviously feeling confident and buoyant and uh, they titled themselves the official the amalgamated society of prop swingers and lead swingers and um, you can see on the front page here they're showing the parachutes with the ammunition boxes and uh, Side slipping was a maneuver which, uh, when people were being trained to fly, they were trained not to side slip, but operationally, it's a very useful technique, and the boys used it all the time. Uh, it's very good for losing height. It's basically pointing the aircraft away from its direction of travel. You increase the drag and lose lift, and you, you basically fall quickly. And uh, it's a great way of side slipping in to land uh, on a, a small airstrip. And uh, it's also useful in air combat because if you side slip, the enemy will try and put his bullets in front of you, but they're actually pointing in the wrong direction because the plane's pointing in the wrong direction. And inside the trench mag, there's lots and lots of satirical uh, messages, which as usual in these sort of publications are very undergraduate, refers to uh, people by non de plumes and uh, has lots of puns and so on. But we've been able to decode some of the people involved and, and this chap here, named Gus Paddock. Uh, we know that that's Corporal Gustav Field, uh, Gus Paddock. And uh, he'd been an original member back in Point Cook. He'd come across and been quartermaster of stores with the squadron. Um, and he, he basically had a very successful war on, in the ground crew there. In October 19, uh, 1918, he was sent on leave to England, where very unfortunately, he got caught up in the influenza pandemic. And he died on the 9th of November, 1918. And uh, 
this is his gravestone back in England. Uh, this hospital has beautifully carved gravestones. They're Commonwealth War gravestones, but they're not in the uh, conventional shape. The patients and the staff of the hospital chose this uh, scroll shape for their particular graveyard. Um, and unfortunately, Gus was uh, only one of eight casualties that Three Squadron had uh, from the flu outbreak. And uh, there were others who also caught it on leave back in England. A uh, very sad story. Uh, one of the guys who died had been another one of the Red Baron's pallbearers, a uh, successful pilot who'd survived many hours of action only to be killed off by a bug. Uh, here's another item from uh, Rod's Trench Magazine. Uh, now, ostensibly it's for swimming lessons uh, by the famous Professor Big Blanc Schmidt, MSN. Now, we've been able to decode this as being Sergeant Mechanic Vincent Smith. He actually won a meritorious service medal for rescuing a pilot from a, a blazing crash. Uh, and, and Vin actually went into the, into the fire three times himself to pull the pilot out and was burned himself. Um, now, however, this, this item is not about swimming lessons. Um, there appears to be a very large amount of double entendre in this. And uh, uh, my interpretation is that Vin got caught with one of the local uh, mademoiselles in a, uh, a local pond. <laughs> and, and so this has resulted in the swimming lesson item. Um, it must have created an enormous amount of amusement for everyone except Vin Smith. Uh, very sadly though, now he came back to Australia with the squadron in 1919, but he was carrying a, um, a head injury from being hit by a propeller. Um, now that propeller hadn't uh, killed him, he'd, he'd basically been able to carry on with his duties, but it did create nerve damage and he is another victim of meningitis and he died in a service hospital in Melbourne and he's buried in Melbourne and his grave is maintained by Commonwealth War Graves. And so this is the only one of the, uh, the three squadron people who died in active service in World War I that uh, we can visit. He's in Australia, all the rest of them are in Europe. One other uh, photograph of Vin here is, uh, this is the salute at the Red Baron's funeral. And here's Vin, he was uh, the Sergeant of the Guard. He was commanding the uh, firing party on that day. And uh, we, we know he was doing that because uh, number one, he's on the duty roster that we've still got preserved. But he also mentioned this to a newspaper in Melbourne uh, after he came back to Australia. And uh, it, it's very sad that the, uh, you know, when we investigate the stories of the people in the, in Rod's Side Slipper magazine, we often find a tragic end not too long after World War I. Uh, and Vin is just one more example of that. Uh, the war was very hard on that generation of people. Now, um, over to you, Philip and Rod. Uh, um, that's the end of my slideshow. So has anyone got any questions? Um, uh, James, um, down in Brooklyn on the uh, Hawkesbury River, there's a, a grave of a person called, um, I think his name's Brewey, B-R-U-I-E. Yes. And uh, there's an inscription there saying that he, whilst not officially uh, recognised as being the person who shot down Red Baron, some records maintain that that was certainly he. I just oh, well, that, yes. you got to make. There's absolutely no question that he put bullets into the Red Baron's plane. I'm just going back to the right slide here. Uh, right. See this landscape? Uh, so Buey was actually, he was an anti-aircraft machine gunner with a Lewis gun, and he was up on this ridge up here. And Popkin was actually down in the valley down there, near the Somme River. And uh, anyway, the Baron went right over the top of Buey, and... Um, people beside him saw pieces coming off the red plane. There, there's no question he was putting hits into it. Uh, but the Baron was shot across the body. And so Buey's angle of fire is basically not right for, for the way the Baron was hit. What happened was that uh, Buey's hits on the aircraft made the Baron turn around. The Baron realised that he'd disobeyed all of his own rules that he used to tell his, uh, his junior staff. And so he turned around and tried to get back to his own lines. And at that stage, he was hit from down here, a bullet going up that way, which went 
uh, hit him under the armpit and it came out over the top of his uh, left breast. So uh, the angle was not is not right for Bowie to fire the killer. On the other hand, um, the killer shot could have been fired by any one of hundreds of men who were probably having a pot with their 303 rifles as well. So, uh, but yes, Bowie's uh, gun sight from, from that um, action is also in the War Memorial as well. It's been engraved. Um, now, our, our problem was that the Royal Air Force basically said, no, uh, we're giving the kill to the, uh, the Royal Air Force guy, Roy, Roy Brown. Yeah, interesting. So any, any other uh, questions? Just a, a side comment. Uh, just a side comment. Um, when, I, uh, when I worked at uh, Roselle Hospital, which is a psychiatric hospital in Sydney, okay. um, well, one of the, um, one of the ma major record keeping areas uh, went back uh, quite some years, and it was rather interesting the number of medical records uh, from uh, you know 1914 to 1920, something like that. And uh, I had a look at some of them, and a lot of them were ex-servicemen. Yes. And then yes. after that, a uh, big gap, and before that, a big gap. So uh, it certainly took its toll in many ways. Yes, the, the number of you know because we lost sixty thousand or sixty one thousand, I believe, dead. But the number of people wounded and, you know, shell-shocked and, and uh, who suffered all sorts of problems, you know, was huge. And then when the Great Depression came along, there was essentially no support for these men. Uh, mm. my, my mother, you know, uh, had memories of, of all these veterans being on the road and, and you know, going from farm to farm, uh, looking for work, you know, uh, do some work in return for board and uh, a bit of food. And, and you feel so sorry for them. Yeah, uh, just a, another comment, getting back to that grave site of Brooklyn, it's it, uh, fairly easy found when you drive in. Um, it, yeah. If you can imagine the top of the cemetery is uh, at 12 o'clock, yeah. it's sort of um, uh, oh, about one o'clock to the, to the top. Yeah. Yeah. The graves are very easily found, actually, and in pretty well, pretty good shape. Yeah, I think there are um, photographs on the, on the internet as well. You can easily find it if you just Google the... Uh, you know, like Brooklyn and Red Baron, you'll get it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've never done that. Yeah. Anyway, I'll shut up and let someone else have a talk. <laughs> James, I, I know this question was asked to you last time, but where was the where was the camera mounted in the RE8? Oh, okay. I'll go to another slide. Uh, right. So uh, here we've got an RE8. Now the observer's cockpit has got this circular top to it, which has a machine gun in it. But the camera was mounted in the front of the observer's cockpit and there was a, a window in the bottom of the plane. Um, so the camera was put into the plane here and uh, photographed straight down uh, to make vertical exposures. Now the camera was actually made out of wood. It was like a wooden box with the lenses and things inside. And there was a wooden magazine that held glass plates, uh, but that had a clockwork mechanism on it which if you wound it up, uh, it would change the plate to the regular interval. And so the observer's job was basically to watch out for bad guys using his machine gun, and then to change the magazine of plates when it needed changing, but that was only occasionally. And the pilot was the one who actually triggered the uh, clockwork mechanism to go off. He had a, a little uh, a flexible cable that he pressed, a button, and um, he had to keep the plane fairly straight and level while he was taking photographs so that they like got overlapping stereo pairs of photographs. Now, there was another installation which was called an oblique camera. And the oblique camera was put uh, actually on the other side of the plane. But the idea was the, the pilot's line of eyesight uh, was looking down over the top of the oblique camera. And if you can imagine, it was like a frame coming out of the side of the plane. Then the camera, the wooden camera was sitting there. And the pilot could basically point that oblique camera like you'd point a gun and um, fly at low level and take low level photographs that showed the landscape as the army commanders might see it, for example. Another thing they did with the oblique cameras was they went to the German side and they took pictures of all the Australian front so that they could tell whether the Australians were showing any vital information to the Germans. Uh, so the oblique cameras though, if you're flying at low level, like say a thousand feet, 
um, you were basically in, in sight of every German in every trench and you'd get thousands of bullets coming your way. And some of the oblique shots we've got are very amusing because uh, the angle of the plane is really dramatically, you know, they're obviously dodging and jinking all over the place uh, in order to stay uh, clear of the anti-aircraft fire. And, and the R-8 had no forward firing. Oh, no, it had a forward, that's a forward firing Vickers just there. So they had a forward firing so was... coordinator with the propeller. Oh, and right. They had a rear okay. defence gun, and they were quite handy. Um, they could defend themselves if they were flown aggressively. Um, and like you can hear in the story, they successfully fought off you know large numbers of German fighters. Uh, I think the largest group I've found is six being fought off. Okay. Uh, however, I must say the RE8 has a reputation of being basically a dangerous aircraft. And it certainly was a dangerous aircraft to learn to fly in. Um, but for the skilled aviators who were trained in three squadron, they flew them aggressively and they got very good results with them. They, they shot down more German planes than we lost RE8s. Well, they certainly looked like they got a lot of engine in front of the wheels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, this is actually called an RAF engine. It's actually a um, uh, Royal Aircraft Factory engine. And... Um, there's a museum in Belgium that's got a crashed one of these and they, they, they've got the serial numbers off it and they were asking me if it was one of ours, but I was pretty sure it wasn't one of ours. Uh, unfortunately, the records about th these engines were very valuable things and uh, very often the plane would be scrapped and the engine would be moved to another, another plane. Uh, there was a shortage of engines at the end of World War I. Any other takers? Uh, Rod, how did you well, get that um, magazine at the end? How did you get that? <laughs> we handled his estate. Ah. We, we handled David Blake's estate. And uh, I, I must have bought it somewhere on the line because it was that and there's a photo album. So... Uh, having a bit of interest in that sort of stuff, I must have bought it at some stage. I have a feeling, and I can't quite remember, um, I think he lived in Thornley or somewhere. Yeah, it was somewhere in Thornley. I think, I think it was in Thornley, because I, I, I have a memory that it was in a box in the garage or something, I don't know, he didn't treasure it very much, I don't think. So, Rod, in, uh, so Rod, it was interesting, so the family obviously didn't want to, you know, they didn't value it when he passed. Uh, there was, I don't think there was any family. Oh, right. I, I, don't, think he, I don't think he had direct descendants. Oh, I'm not, look, I'm not 100% sure on that. It was a long time ago, Michael. It was somewhere back in the late 70s or early 80s, I would imagine. Oh, it's a good thing you saved head. It's a good thing you saved it. Oh, it'll end up in the War Memorial one day. That's what I'll do with it. Um... What I think is interesting about it is obviously, and James, you might correct me on this, but it's obviously made with a, a, a jelly pad type stencil, but then all that fancy outline has probably done, been done freehand, I reckon. Um, well, look, Rod, I, I think that, uh, yes, it's been done, the, the original's been done freehand, but um, they would have run off a lot of, a lot of copies of this. Uh, so somehow they're, they're printing the... Uh, what, what we can see brown, purple, blue, green, right? So we've got four colours, quite good. Yeah, but I think the I think the purple part probably would have been done with a stencil, some description. But I was just looking at this sort of Art Nouveau type work around the the, the, yes, forms, yes. the border. Yeah. I think no, that's no, been that... done afterwards. And and, and right, that looks like a female impression there in the top right. Does that look like a lady? <laughs> I think it's just meant to be art well, nouveau. You... It's supposed to be clouds, but uh, <laughs> I think it's... You, you might have been at the front too long, Michael. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Michael, your your dirty mind's happening, happening again. You, you, you're seeing you're seeing things that you you, you just aren't there, mate. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, well, Rod, I've been delving. I've, I've been digging into my Victorian ancestry, so I've sort of been steeped in a lot of old historical stuff. So you start seeing things after a while. 
Well, too early enough. for a gestetna, wouldn't it, to produce that on a gestetna? No, it would have been down on a jelly pad, where they where you basically make an impression into gelatine, and then um, you, you you basically have uh, you, you lay the paper. Didn't didn't you have jelly pads when you were at school, Colin? You must have gone to a very fancy school. You probably had slates with bloody slate pencils, did you? I've never heard of a jelly pad. Well, we, we still had them in the 60s at Waitara Public. The teacher yeah. was still still using them. We, we just put a piece of paper and rub it over the top and you'd peel it off and you'd have that sort of purple outline. So, you you know, you do a map of Australia basically in the jelly and then you'd basically lay a bit of ink and then pull it off. You can use it over and over. In fact, if you look them up, if you look them up online, I'm, I'm sure that there's a, one of the, the school museums is still... Uh, Still got one or, or still show one operating to the kids or something or other. Mm. So it's still quite doable. Never heard of it, Rod. Well, there you learn something every day. Well, I tell you, in, in 1960, whatever it was, in Waitara Public, um, <laughs> my, teach, my teacher was using it. And I'll tell you something, I met that teacher at a barbecue when I was a, well, probably just before I was married, I'd say, but, but Somewhere in the 80s, I met her again and I, I looked at her and I, I knew who she was. And, she, and I said to the bloke running the party, I said, uh, is she a teacher? And he goes, yes. And um, anyway, I, I, crack, I, I struck up a bit of a conversation with her and I said, I said, I like you because you let me use your jelly pad to do things. She said, I only threw out the tray the other day, she said. <laughs> there you go. Any other questions for James? Yeah, I can see one question on the uh, on the chat line. Actually, I'll just go back to the near the start. Uh, it's about the uh, rotary engine on the uh, box kite. Yeah, that was me. You said radio. You said rotary engine. Yeah, right. So I'll tell you the difference between a rotary and a and a radial. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Now, um, so this is a rotary engine. That is that the actual cylinders of the engine rotate. Oh, right. Um, and yes. the, the only fixed thing is the crank shaft in the middle. Yeah. Now, uh, so this was a very common sort of engine in World War I aircraft. Both the Sopwith Camel and the Fokker triplane had rotary engines. Uh, there were enormous advantages in those early days because the rotating engine cooled itself. It's an air-cooled engine. And um, in, you might know in the Sopwith Camel that the rotating engine actually acted like a gyroscope. And the, uh, the plane could turn, I think, starboard about three times faster than it could turn to port. And so uh, it gave it a, an additional uh, gyroscopic turning moment when they were flying in air combat. Um, now, so the, the, the box kite had a, a rotary engine. Now, um, as engines improved in power after World War I, um, basically the rotary engine became obsolete and the similarly uh, radial engine where all the, uh, the engine is fixed and only the uh, crankshaft rotates, um, that basically uh, was then current right up to the, uh, you know, the advent of jet engines. And uh, uh, we had some very powerful radial engines like, you know, uh, the Qantas Constellation uh, aircraft, that sort of thing, uh, had really sophisticated radial engines, uh, whereas the rotaries sort of uh, died um, more or less at the end of World War One. That was the end of them. Wow. Just getting back to your title, side slipping. But when I learned <laughs> to fly, you can really drop a lot of height very, very quickly uh, by side slipping. Yes, indeed. Yes. And if you're, if you're too high for the runway and you really want to get down real quick, it's a quick way of getting down. Yeah, it's, it's also a quick way of killing yourself if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> that's very true. There's a, um, there's a classic story about someone side-slipping a, uh, a passenger jet that was uh, had the engine failure or something and it had to come in for a very short runway. Gimli glider. Glide, 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 oh, yes. That's the one. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, side slipping will, will give you um, a, a fast rate of sink and a, a slower mm. speed. Um, as long as you don't stall the thing, then, you know, 
it uh, it can be very useful. And in fact, I think that the boys just did it because it was Larry. You know, it's like uh, um, the feeling is something like you get on a ski slope, you know, where you're, you're sort of sliding around the corners yeah. and, and losing height very rapidly. It'd also be a good uh, uh, manoeuvre to get away from the enemy if they're firing at you, that's for sure. Yeah, that's right. So look in this picture, this guy is basically trying to shoot where the where the RE8 going to be in a second, right? And if the RE8 is actually going this way, not that way, then then he doesn't get shot. You know, it's yeah. quite a useful technique. No, no, no. You basically, basically bank one way and steer the other, don't you? Yeah, that's correct. Yes, you're mm. crossing over the controls. Yeah. Yeah. Mixing the faces. <laughs> <laughs> That was actually a joke made to me by, by Henry Miller. So Henry was a designer of the CT2, CT2 train aircraft that our Air Force used for many years. He was my neighbour growing up. And um, he mentioned that uh, some glider had uh, a, uh, a half-inch pin and a three-eighth-inch pin that wanted to connect the two cables to the two sides of the rudder. So you couldn't put them in the wrong sides. And somebody got one and found the hole was the wrong side. He drilled it out, put the pins in the one they want anyway. So the rudder pedal to switch over. So he made the joke calling that missing the process. He said, Posey. Yeah, so mm. I laughed at the time. I was only 16. Yeah, there's uh, endless sad stories about parts which can be put in the wrong way in the aviation industry. Um, mm -hmm. I actually had a lecture once from a guy who was involved in building nuclear bombs. And at one stage in the 1960s, 90% of um, American nuclear bombs didn't actually work because on the assembly line, only if you were left-handed did you put the fuse in the right way. And they had like uh, nine out of 10 operators were right-handed, the fuse went in upside down, and only the left-handed guy was making nuclear bombs that were gonna work. Well, that must have made the world a safer place. <laughs> That's a no, they they thought, made it more it? dangerous as soon as they discovered it. <laughs> I say that's a sinister thought, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Very good, Clifford. Bad joke for us. <laughs> right handed communist spies. <laughs> Very good presentation, James. I really.